morning to you all this morning. Good to see you all this morning and a few unfamiliar faces. Welcome and nice to have you with us here this morning. Before we come to our reading and to our passage uh, this morning, just uh, as you saw the notes like yesterday, just about Annie Jones who passed away and yesterday. I actually saw on Thursday, I just felt I need to go and see her. And, uh, and, uh, and I did. And uh, so, I uh, went to go and see her. She was so weak and frail. She was having lunch, having to be uh, fed. And um, she couldn't even lift her head up. She was so weak, couldn't talk. And um, so I sat with her, built into her room after lunch. And, um, and she just sat there in a wheelchair looking so frail and so ready to go be with the Lord. Uh, she couldn't respond. I asked her lots of questions and she couldn't look ready to reply. And, um, and I, I know Annie Jones so well to Annie. Uh, uh, she even she still had her Bible open on her bed. And, um, and so I read for, for her from Exodus 15 and um, the Song of Moses. And, uh, and we spoke, I spoke, you know, saying uh, to her about, uh, about going to be with the Lord and, and what a wonderful day that would be. And um, I wasn't even sure whether or not she knew who I was or whether I was there and she was so unresponsive. And when I read Exodus 15, she looked up at me and looked straight at me and said, thank you, Kevin. And then he fell down again. And uh, that just summed up any Jones for me, uh, that she, she loved God's word because she loved God so much. And right till the very end, um, she never lost that. So details of the arrangements and for the memorial and the funeral will we'll let you know once once the family has, has decided and uh, yeah the lord takes the lord also gives uh bible says uh, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and so this saturday is darren and jenny lee's big day as they're going to be getting married right here in the chapel and uh, darren's a soccer player this is going to be your biggest win so far and uh, biggest day whatever other trophies you might lift that's one trophy you want to uh, certainly have on your shelf, uh, but the uh, yeah, Lord bless you guys, and uh, yeah, I've enjoyed this to get to know you, and we we'll pray much for you guys, and we'll have your marriage together. So I'm going to uh, pray for us, and I'm going to read for us this morning, and then we pray as we, as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word just today. We thank you, Lord God, for these songs that you could sing today, that, uh, that you really have put it scripture into song for us Lord that we can relate to the truths of these songs because we know them to be true from the word and so Lord today as we've sang these songs and you've already done your work in our hearts to prepare it Lord as fertile soil to receive your word we do pray Lord God that you would speak to us for me Lord God your servants are listening not because of something we have done or so some uh, greatness on our part or ability on our part because of your Holy Spirit, who we know is at work, revealing you to us and making you known to us, for you live in us, Lord. And so we do pray that your Holy Spirit would, would do all the necessary work here in this place, in our hearts, here today. For those who know you and have known you for many years and have come to love you deeply, you have that great blessed assurance, Lord. For those here today, perhaps who are just searching, who aren't sure what to believe, who aren't sure if they are ready to believe in you or what you're even about. We pray, Lord God, for all that you would speak to us today. You brought us here, and Lord, we pray for those who can't be with us today. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for the life and witness of Auntie Annie from right until the very end, Lord. She proved herself as faithful. And Lord, we just commit the family to you and all their preparations and ask, Lord, for your rich blessing upon them, Lord. And so, Lord, we do come before you now as your servants, and we ask of God that you would speak and meet with us in Jesus' name. We're going to turn in, in Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to read the first 11 verses here this morning. Let us fear this any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, 
because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I saw in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has suddenly spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, same good day, but so long afterward in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. But if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Thank you. We live in such busy times, aren't we? And uh, it is a day and age in which uh, the busyness, in the, this thing in particular, is a major contributing factor to our busyness. Uh, the phone is just always there, always watching, always listening, always waiting uh, for, for that call, for your attention. And we know it creates so much busyness around it. You, you remember the days, some of us can remember the days when the phone was still attached to a wall somewhere in the house where you have to go and find the phone somewhere and um, now these things travel with us and uh, of course if you know, the phone rings if you don't answer it uh, you, you almost sense an irritation like why didn't you answer my call you know you answer maybe well, I might have been in the shower at the time or I might have uh, been doing something like driving and want to cause an accident uh, but there is such an expectation today of of to do more in less time. And uh, there is an expectation with the technology around uh, that there is such a busyness that the expectations on all of us is so much greater. You know, many of our young people are busy with exams at the moment and they're uh, thinking much again and assignments and all kinds of things that are due. And it's that end of the year push, as they say, just before the Christmas show. And, uh, and we just are already so so busy. So it feels like such a timely word at this busy time of the year to have a passage like this read to us and for us to consider the time that we have. The result of all this busyness can only be stress. And so many people are stressed. Uh, there's no time anymore for important things. There's no time anymore for things like prayer and the word of God and for service or family and friends. There just seems to be an endless list of things to do and things that we must attend to. And we are reminded in this passage today for us to reflect on the importance of God's perfect rest. You want to write a note and put a heading on your notes, God's perfect rest. That's what we're going to think about here today. So please don't nod off. Uh, it's different to the kind of sleepy rest that you might get later on today if you're uh, not too busy. Uh, you'll find some time to have that Sunday afternoon nap and, uh, and, uh, and get some physical uh, rest. But now we're talking about a different kind of rest here. In fact, the kind of rest that we're talking about here, we see, is actually at the heart of the good news, uh, of the good news gospel message. It is a matter, it is not just a side, tropical, secondary issue. It is a, a salvation issue that we are considering here today. You see, uh, uh, sleep uh, uh, is something that, that we do and our bodies need it, but before long you need to sleep again because it doesn't actually totally satisfy the soul. And you see here, salvation is, 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 the, is the issue that we are discussing here. It needs our full attention as opposed to sleep. Uh, this is something far greater. We're not just talking here even about obedience to the fourth commandment which says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You know, that's, it is, that is not something, as we will see, as a way of salvation or a means to be saved. And some in this Hebrews chapter 4 
and use it in this particular passage to, to justify a Saturday, Sabbath day rest. As if somehow keeping it can somehow make you more holy in obedience or following it. But that is contrary, we know, to the gospel message uh, that we find in the Bible. So we have a lot to think about here today, a lot that we're going to have to be able to work through, and I hope we can get uh, through it all here today. Hebrews 4 itself doesn't say that Sabbath keeping can save us. I need to say that up front because there are many who would say that this passage points to a Sabbath keeping people. This passage, Hebrews 4 itself, doesn't even say to us that somehow by keeping a Saturday Sabbath, uh, that it somehow makes you more holy in obedience. But what does it say? If we look carefully and if we, if we listen to what, this, what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us, it starts with the therefore. And as you know, whenever you see that therefore, it's drawing out again. It's not just a filler word. It's an important word in a passage when you come to it. It's pointing you to something that we look carefully and that we listen to what's been gone before. And that therefore connects with what has been said previously. If you enjoy your series, you know, and often the thing will pop up previously and then they'll go on to what happened last week. So you can follow the next episode of the series that you're watching. And the therefore is the previously on uh, Hebrews with, uh, of what, what is just God. And, and, and you need to recap uh, your memory as to what is said in this case in chapter 3. And what's been said before. It's the writer's building on the case. He's not, here's something new we're going to talk about. He's, he's building on what has been said, uh, what, what has been said already, uh, the case that's been made, and, and he stands on it. And so that therefore sets the context for us and gives therefore the meaning to what has what is about to be said. Previously, you see the importance of, we saw that last week, of not hardening our hearts. Of not hardening our hearts towards God, in particular in the rebellion of sinful and having a sinful and unbelieving heart that turns away from God. That's what Hebrews chapter 3 says in verse, uh, in, in verse 12. Or we will not enter God's rest. And then he uses Israel as the example of a people who didn't enter God's rest. They didn't answer the promised land. Of course, he's pointing to, to when they came out of Egypt, to them delivered miraculously from Egypt, and came to the promised land, but couldn't, didn't believe that they could conquer the promised land, and so they withdrew, and as a result, they spent 40 years in the desert. God's word still stands, and the promises are always certainly true. And here in particular, the promise is of God's perfect rest, that we all desperately need so much. And if we think of the, the context and the example of Israel, remember uh, Israel, they were slaves in Egypt. They, they, were, they were dispossessed of land. They were foreigners and aliens in, in, this, in, in, in Egypt. Uh, they were devoid of human rights, any proper human rights, and they certainly were being exploited in their, in their actions. So they came as a, as a needy people, and God came to these people. And we see and we know that when God brought them out of Egypt, He brought them out with the promise of land, of something better, and rest from their enemies. I will give you rest from your enemies on, on all sides. Verse 1 reminds us that God's promise of rest still stands. Not like our promise to rest, uh, in, in which we, we fail. Uh, thankfully, our obedience to the commands of God doesn't grant us salvation. We, we are granted salvation by grace. And so obedience to the command to rest, uh, to enter that rest, uh, is appointing us to, to the grace of God that has been promised to us. God's promise of perfect rest still stands, and we must, we must see that. But we are encouraged here, and it says, let us be careful to not to have fallen short to, of the promise of God, of that fall short of that rest. Uh, to, to rest, uh, we'd, be, we'd be deprived of that rest by a sinful, unbelieving heart. And so the implications of this in, in terms of salvation is made very clear in verse 2 of, of chapter 4, that we have had the good news proclaimed to us like them. 
What does the good news say here? The promise of, of deliverance from their slavery, the promise of, of, of land, the promise of peace that had been given to them. That promise had been given to them. And theirs, they were slaves, and in their case they were slaves, and, and this promise came to them of, of earthly land. And likewise, we see the parallels with that of how we as are, are slaves of, of, of our sin and we're slaves to sin. And this promise of the course is of an eternal land, that our Zion is our, our holy city that we are, are looking forward to. And for all, it is a promise of freedom. It is a promise of deliverance and a promise that gives us much hope. But the message we see in itself doesn't make salvation effective. And it comes by hearing, we know, the word of God, but just hearing the message. They heard the message, right? They heard the, the good news message that God is going to deliver them and give them this land, but they were not careful to enter that rest because of their faith and their, it was lacking and their, their doubts and their hard hearts had, had formed into this unbelief. And, and we think of that as an example to us of how we too can be hard in our hearts and how we can hear the message and we can come to church and we can hear the gospel preached and we can read even in the Bible and see the message there. But if we fail to believe it and put it into practice, it falls on the ground and is eaten up by the birds, as the, that parable tells us. It is lost effectively. Just hearing the message we see in our passage this morning, the good news gospel does not save. Hearing that message cannot save in itself. It does not save in itself. Many have heard the good news from their lips. Even they, in the case of the Israelites, heard it from the lips of Moses. They didn't believe. In the best of preachers, they didn't believe. Many heard from the lips of Jesus the good news proclaimed to them, and they chose not to believe. Some heard from Peter and from Paul. And this is a great encouragement to us as preachers, it's just an in, inside thing, but uh, uh, is that you always feel so inadequate in your preaching, and you, you always want to see better results and more results. It's always such an encouragement when you think of the failures of, of Moses. The failures, can I say, dare I say, of Jesus? that people fail to believe even to his preaching. The failures of Peter and Paul, the greatest preachers that ever lived. And then people rejected the message and would not, they refused to believe and therefore they were not saved. The hardening of the hearts came about because they lacked the necessary faith to be saved by that message that they were hearing. The message was good. The message was effective. The message was there for them. They refuse to believe it. Like when we hear God's word and we refuse to accept it, believe it, and put it into practice. Verse 2 it says, The message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who did obey. In the case of the Israelites, it was, of course, Joshua and Caleb who believed and obeyed. They were going to the promised land. All the rest would die in the desert. Saving faith is believing the word of God. And believing is seeing the obedience to Jesus Christ, as you find in the Word of God. We have rest because God rests. And if we think, I mean, if we go to and think a little bit around around God's rest in Genesis chapter two, remember Genesis chapter one, He creates. Genesis chapter two begins with God resting. Well, why did God rest? Why do we rest? Well, we might rest because I'm tired, right? Can't keep my eyes open anymore because I'm human and I'm and I'm fallen and so I need constantly rest to rejuvenate this tired of body of mind. And that's what we do. Why did God rest? Because he couldn't keep his eyes open? Because he was tired? No, not at all. He rested because he rested because it tells us he was finished. When he was finished, he rested. When did Jesus rest? You know, Jesus experienced as a human being, as, 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 as God in the form of flesh, he came and he rested, he grew, he grew tired, and, uh, and the pressures and the relentless demands that were placed on him. We know that Jesus enjoyed earthly human rest, but there was a greater rest. Jesus rested in the tomb for three days. Why? Because his work was finished. He had done what he came, what he set out to do. And in verses 3 and 4, as the negative is true, verse 3, 
are those who will not enter the rest. That's the negative side of the of the good news, that those who will, will not enter the rest. So the positive also stands that by faith, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we will be saved. That is our hope and the promise. The promise of entering into God's perfect rest. It is an eternal rest that is received when you put your faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. And it saves you from our bondage to sin. We do not, and, and we're told not to fall short. That's an interesting word there. The idea is, is of a race. There's many ideas where this word is used in the context in the, in the original Greek. But there's many meanings. But what that particularly caught my attention is this idea of falling short. It's the idea of, of running a race and falling short to the finish line. Not getting to the end. Of course, my heart goes out to those guys running comrades. And, and you see that little man come out with his gun. <laughs> and, uh, and you know what is happening. The, the cutoff is coming. And you can see people in the background. And the crowds are screaming at them. God! You've been running for the last, what is it, 10 hours or something. And God is screaming. But their legs are finished. And they fall short. Their gun goes off. And they pull a strap or something across the finish line. And you can't go over the line. Time is up and the race is over. Well, you could have run for the last 10 hours. Your feet can be bleeding, doesn't matter. You don't finish. They fall short. And the idea is, do not fall short, as in the idea of, a, of us running the race. Do not fall short to the finish line. Hearing enters you into the race. Hearing the gospel enters you into the race and gives you opportunity to participate in the race. But if you do not cross the finish line, you do not put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can, and that, that entry, that message, the word of God that comes to us, it will not help you. It will not save you. And we fail in what God, we, we fail in, in our obedience to the word of God. Now we know that sleep is not perfect rest. That even after the best good night's sleep, after that sweet afternoon nap, and you wake up refreshed, Ready for the evening by 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock, maybe, probably, I know, 6 o'clock in your pajamas are ready. You're ready for that rest again, aren't you? You need to repeat again and again because it's human rest. It's not perfect rest. This is not what, when, when we're talking about God's perfect rest, we're not talking about our sleep habits and whether or not we can, we can rest properly. We're also not talking about entertainment and relaxation because we've so often confuse the idea of God's perfect rest with, with entertainment, with relaxation. I mean, we need to, to just slow down sometimes and just rest and, and, and catch up with, our, with ourselves. Uh, but that, we know, is not perfect rest. As much as many will try and make it entertainment and, and relaxation, it's kind of it's a golden lock, isn't it? Uh, just racing from, from one form of entertainment to another, you ever had those holidays when the holiday is so busy? You feel like you need a holiday off the holiday because you've been so busy, you've been rushing and racing around all over the place, and you realize that wasn't resting, that wasn't relaxing, it was actually a very busy holiday. Uh, and so, uh, interesting, the word holiday comes from holy day, it's meant to be a day of, of perfect rest. And as much as many will try and make relaxation, rest and relaxation a golden love, it doesn't satisfy, and it doesn't enrich you as this kind of rest that Hebrews is talking about. Very soon again, we grow tired. Sometimes disappointingly, you wake up and you feel more tired than when you went to sleep. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but I was a bored or not, I was a sleepwalking or not, and I feel more tired now than I'm waking up. Sometimes even that doesn't, even earthly rest doesn't help us to be refreshed. Here we see, we must we must not uh, uh, confuse those two things with, with one another. We grow tired and, and bored of, of even entertainment and relaxation. We can grow frustrated by it and even annoyed by it. Uh, and you see that perfectly, uh, the perfect example of that is the super rich. And uh, you, you, you seem to need more. So drug abuse and uh, is so prevalent in those in those communities, in those societies, those high societies of the of the super rich and the celebrities, that you find so many of them succumbing to to drug abuse because they don't know this perfect rest. All the yachts in the world, 
All the houses and the pool parties cannot satisfy your soul. Jonah only identifies God's perfect rest for the believer as peace with God. That is perfect rest. As freedom to serve Jesus Christ. That's God's perfect rest. And deliverance even from the Mosaic law, the Old Testament Mosaic law. And in Genesis 2, verse 2, which I refer to, God, God's works have been finished since the creation of the world. And we read there in verse 4, that on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. It was done. Unlike our human rest, which is imperfect and often is born out of a sinful laziness, because the work is hard and because of, sin, because of sin's curse and, and because we are weakened by the effect of sin that makes the work even harder, God's rest, my rest as he calls it, is the perfect promised rest. As God rested after all his works, and so he talks about my rest, which is your rest. His, work, his rest was perfect. And so here he says God's rest is my rest that is promised. That is a perfect rest. Unlike sleep, unlike entertainment, unlike earthly relaxation, and all those kind of things that rotate around hedonism, the desire, the pursuit of pleasure, God's rest is perfect and satisfies the soul. As God rested after all his works of creation and in Genesis chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, in his work of recreation, that is our salvation through the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ's work on the cross, we can now have rest. Rest from our works. We rest from, from striving for perfection because God's already made us perfect. We rest from the law because God has satisfied the law. You are loved. You are accepted by God. There's no need to keep striving and trying to, to get somehow to some satisfactory standard. Because God met the perfect standard and has imputed it into us by His Holy Spirit as He works His word into us. We rest from our good works which cannot save us because Jesus Christ has saved us already. You can't save a saved person. You don't see lifeguards running up and down the beach with helping people on their towels. They are poor. There's no danger for them, is there? There's people who are drowning, the lost, who need to be saved. And because we are saved already, our good works and all our efforts and all the things that we do, we know it cannot save us. That's not the kind, we, that's not the kind of way that we can be saved. We are saved already, and therefore we can enter into his perfect rest. Rest from all our works. Verse 3, it says, we who have believed enter that rest. God's perfect rest. And throughout chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Hebrews, you might have noticed that unbelievers are contrasted with believers. Unbelievers not having that rest, believers having the perfect rest. It's ours, I promise. I'm just reminding you of it here today. But offering it to you as a believer, I'm telling you, you have it already. Whether you're using it or not is another story altogether. Whether you're appreciating the blessed assurance that you have or not, that's a different story altogether. I'm just reminding you of what is there already. If you're an unbeliever, then you don't have this rest that I'm talking about. And so chapter 3 and 4, this contrast keeps happening. And with good effect, he's, he's pointing something out here. He's contrasting what a unbeliever experiences, their experience of this life as opposed to the believer's experience. And the two are contrasted against one another. Believers both in turn, and believers and unbelievers are contrasted both in terms of our natures and in terms of our destiny in Jesus Christ. The promise of perfect rest is exclusively for those who believe in God's Son, the Prince of Peace who gives us rest. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give you as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled, do not be afraid. Rest I leave with you, my rest I give you, and not like this world gives us. Repeatedly in our passage today, there's, there are these, and last week, there are these sworn statements. So I saw on oath, I it's a sworn statement is made emphatically by God 
that those who do not have faith to believe in Him, who are hardening their hearts by disobeying God and His call to salvation, and their promise is repeated again and again. Why do they repeat anything? Is so that we will get it and know it to be true, and to believe that they will not enter my rest, God's perfect rest. Isaiah 48, 22 says, There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Romans 3, 23 tells us that all of us have sinned. And not just that is not just some extreme uh, group of particularly evil people. It is all, the original says all, uh, it is meaning all people have sinned and so are denied God's rest because of sin and denied God's peace, peace with God because of, the, of sin and we, we, God is a holy God. But the very next verse in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, says that all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. He has redeemed us. And this gives us tremendous hope. And therefore, based on that redemption, based on our salvation, in verse 6 it says, it still remains for some to enter that rest. Those who formerly had good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of disobedience. There's a very clear line in the sand. What was their disobedience? What was their great sin? What was the terrible thing that they did? They did not believe. They did not believe the good news that came to them that they could have the promised land. And perhaps you here today, this is you here today, that you need to enter into God's rest. I'm sure some of you are just perfectly tired. You just had a busy week. Maybe you've got a busy week ahead of you. Maybe you had a late night box night. That series was just too good. You binge watched something or you were out busy doing all kinds of things. I don't know what can cause you earthly unrest. Uh, it's sometimes medical conditions that people have trouble falling asleep. But here we're talking about in a turmoil and, and all of that is that we have that, that as believers we have received we've been delivered from that inner turmoil from that unrest and the call here yeah, if you are the person who who remains still to enter into that rest the call is very clear here yeah, that you need to come and enter into god's rest that meaning receive his salvation Leave the busy rush, that inner turmoil, the, the fighting and the striving and believe the good news that Jesus Christ has died for you. That only you can be saved through the saving work of Jesus Christ and enter into his perfect rest. Verse 7, the call goes out to you, not to the Israelites there in the Egypt, but to them in that then, today, he says. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like they did back then. And like subsequent generations have since. Do not harden your hearts. Because we know tomorrow never comes, right? Today is the day we need to make right with God. Do not harden your hearts. Tomorrow never comes. And, and likewise, he doesn't say yesterday, as we saw last week, relying on, on what, what God once did in your life and what once happened, a decision you might have made many years ago, today if you're convicted by his voice, convicted by the word of God, make right with him. Because we have been received this great promise for all the believe. You need to make right now. Others cannot make right on your behalf. Today, he says, if your parents hear his voice, no, he says today, if you hear if, if you hear my voice, we need to put our faith in Him. So others cannot, on your behalf, somehow make you right with God. You cannot rely on your parents or the faith of your, your spouse or, or a friend or your pastor. Moses could not save his people. Not even he would enter the promised land because he lacked faith and disobedience was in his heart as well. His successor, Joshua, who, who led the people to enter, he had faith, he can take the land, let's do it. He went in, his successor, Moses' successor, Joshua, who led the people into the promised land, but he could not offer them perfect rest. 
Today, even, they're still fighting for the land with their hostile neighbors. And this is why God promised another day. The day of the Lord that would come. Then Jesus Christ rose from the dead, victorious over sin and death. It's interesting, maybe you know this, I'll tell you, say it because many may don't know this, but the name Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua, which translates to English as Joshua, and that's how we get the name Joshua. And that's why often the connection is made between the name Joshua and the name of Jesus. The mention of Joshua's name here is particularly important for us, because here in verse 8, it is reminding us of the expectation of the perfect Joshua who would come. Of Jesus who would come. The one who would save. The one who would come to deliver us from our sins. The second Joshua and Jesus would finish what the first Joshua left undone. Because Jesus Christ is greater than Moses and greater than Joshua and he can save. God's arrest has been put in place and it was established and it remains in place for all those who believe in Jesus Christ. Verse 9 and 10, we as God's people who have entered into God's rest, now rest from our works. That's not a call for laziness. That's not a call for self-indulgent behavior. We rest from our works of salvation, of our striving of somehow to save ourselves just as God rested from his work, so we enter into his rest. Of course, the question, and I, I feel I need to deal with it, I'll get the question this afternoon, and then next week I'll have to deal with it. So I'm, this is a preemptive strike uh, for those of you who, who, who have questions. The literal day of a Saturday Sabbath rest comes to mind. I'm sure you've been thinking about that. Particularly when you read a verse that says, therefore, rem therefore remains a Sabbath rest for God's people. And of course, are we in disobedience for not meeting on the Sabbath as in Saturday? Sunday is not a Sabbath. It is the Lord's Day. Saturday is the Sabbath day if you want to get technical about particular days. Uh, the Lord's Day, is, today is the first day of the week. Sabbath is the last day of the week. So there's a lot, we can't confuse the two things in, in, in a lot of ways. But should we Sabbath? as in a literal Saturday, Sabbath day of rest, as the Jewish people do. A day of rest. It is. In fact, if you look at what a Sabbath is, it is a, it means rest. It is a day of rest in this case, uh, spending time with the Lord, a day uh, spent and uh, set apart from the busyness of the work week. And that can only be good for us, right? Spending time with the Lord. It's important because so often we, like Martha, are generally just too busy. You know the story of Mary and Martha? Can read about Mary and Martha? Mary's always at the feet of Jesus. Martha's always busy doing dishes in the sink and preparing food. She's always busy, always rushing around. So many of us are like this Martha. There's a Martha in all of us. And we're just too busy rushing around, filling our days with too many things to do, and not taking time to spend with the Lord. And that is often the case in evidence of pride and independence from God, where our hearts are devoted to self and to gain, to gain more, to do more, and not to God. In fact, the prophets in the Old Testament, interestingly, saw that reaching the Sabbath rest, by not keeping the Sabbath was necessary for spiritual life, keeping the Sabbath rest and breaching it was a, a violation that was symptomatic of deeper spiritual problems. In fact, we describe it as rebellion to God by not spending time with Him. The Old Testament Sabbath was a day of not engaging in unnecessary work, of, of not racing about doing what pleases ourselves, but what pleases the Lord. So the Sabbath was a joyful day, it was a day of restoration, a day of reflection, and a day of worship. My understanding of Sabbath, of those things, that can only be a good thing. But recognize this, that such a Sabbath rest cannot save. And as some of you do keep a Sabbath, it cannot save us, nor can it give you the kind of rest that is spoken of in this passage, of God's perfect rest, of peace with God that only God can give. 
And this is why we see from the earliest days of the, of the early church that the Sabbath day as such was replaced by the first day of the week. That believers are, are free to keep the Sabbath but are not obliged by it. They very quickly realize that the Sabbath is a day that's good for us but we're not obliged to keep such a day. Colossians 2 verse 16 says, Therefore do not let anyone judge you with regards to mentions a few things there, particularly mentions a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And so it's Saturday, Sabbath day, keeping such a day is used by some as a, a, a means of salvation, or even as held up as some kind of super spirituality, I keep the Sabbath. And it's used by, to call them Sabbatarians, uh, to somehow wear it as a badge, I keep the Sabbath, and therefore I'm more spiritual, I'm more home than the rest of you who don't do such a thing. Sabbath is given to us as a gift of God's grace, not a gift of the law. It's not something that by keeping it, you can earn your salvation. Our salvation has been earned already. God is at rest, seated on His throne, and we enter into that rest through salvation. Warren Wesley says, Saturday Sabbath is identified with the law. We work for six days and then you rest. But the Lord's day is identified with grace. God's people trust in Christ and then the works follow from that. The Lord's day celebrates the resurrection, a, a work of, of recreation. Not recreation, recreation. Yes, that's where we get our word recreation from. But in a spiritual Bible sense of the word is a work of recreation. God is making all things new. Observing the Sabbath is a, if it is for you some form of legalistic righteousness, you're on the wrong track. As it is for some people. The irony is that the, the Sabbath keeping is exactly what this passage says we are given rest from. We are given rest from our works. So, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ on the dead. That's why we have church on a Sunday, not on a Saturday, because we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. We are no longer bound by the law, nor are we dependent upon it, on our good deeds. How somehow hopefully outweighing our bad deeds to sit up the scales in our favor, but rather God has established for us a rest by sending His Son to do the work the cross, to die for our sins, lying in that grave, resting, that it was raised to life again, to give us new life. His saving work is done, and so is ours, if we put our faith in Him to save. We do what He requires in faith and obedience, to do His will and serving Him, so that we will not fall away as we are told here, and die a spiritual death. Diligently we seek to serve and to follow our Lord Jesus Christ because our rest is in the person of Jesus, not in observing special days and ceremonies that cannot save us, but that we have a responsibility to, 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 to work out that salvation, to continue in that salvation through our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he says, make every effort that is, make every effort to come to Jesus Christ and to remain in Him through your faithful obedience to Him that we find in God's Word. Let's die. Lord, we have today received from You once again from Your Word, Lord. As busy people, Lord, as people who live in, in such times that there is so much busyness around us and racing and we're chasing off all kinds of things. Lord, we pray that you would deliver us from that evil, Lord. And Lord Jesus, we would find our rest in you. Our perfect peace and our perfect rest is in you. We thank you for the salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus. And I pray if there is someone here today who doesn't know this rest, who doesn't know this peace with you, peace with God, and has not entered this, this rest because, hey, they were hard in their hearts to believe the message up until this point. 
so busy in their own strength to try and earn their salvation, work their own way to receive favor from you. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us rest from all of that. And if there is someone here today, Lord, who doesn't know your rest, pray, oh God, that you've given the faith today to enter that rest, to believe in you by faith, and to receive you as their Savior, the only one who can save and rescue us from all our works. Thank you, Lord God, for the salvation that is ours, for the promised peace and rest that we have received from you. I pray, Lord, for those who are busy among us, believers among us who are busy, Lord, who are distracted by worldly things, by earthly pursuits, by things, Lord God, that cannot offer us rest, that just burn us out, just tire us, and it's relentless, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you will will stand on the promises of God and enter into that rest psychologically, Lord, that we would mentally recognize and believe the word of God that we have rest in you and enter physically and emotionally and ultimately spiritually into the promises of God's word, into that rest that you give us. And receiving the promised gift that you have granted us. So bless us, Lord, we pray. For this week that lies ahead, with I'm sure so much in it, exams and tending to the various demands that are made of us and the needs that exist we see around us, help us, Lord God, to quietly walk with you in all that we do and not wander off in our own pursuits, in our own busyness, and wander away from Give us all we pray. Bless us now as we go. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we close with one more song this morning.